YCS Las Vegas, Nevada is officially in the books, and despite being in a time zone three hours ahead, I still spent my weekend watching the live stream and checking up on the written coverage so that you wouldn't have to. This is what the heck happened at the 3v3 YCS Las Vegas. First off, the attendance was absolutely staggering. YCS Las Vegas had a ridiculous 1,713 players in attendance, which made up 571 teams. This makes it the largest team YCS in Yu-Gi-Oh history, which in my opinion really says something about people's excitement for the game right now. Side note, I was at the same event last February, and while the events and the experience were amazing, it wasn't anywhere near this large. Now, of course, with the record-breaking attendance did come some complications for the event. Apparently, the doors for the venue opened two to three hours later than they announced, and I guess to put this into context, last year there was about a one-hour delay, so I would say that it's fair to assume that even Konami didn't expect this many players to show up. Obviously, coming off its YCS Costa Rica win, Fire Decks were the talk of the town and were not only the favorite to win YCS Vegas, but also expected to be the most popular of decks. However, for day one of the live stream, Konami really went out of their way to try to feature other decks and make sure that it wasn't just all Fire Mirror matches. In fact, they took a particular interest in the Voiceless Voice deck. Now, this may have been because, as Billy Break alluded to, the deck wasn't represented at the Ultimate UDS last week at all. Regardless, Voiceless Voice got a tremendous amount of early coverage and was basically featured every round if you take into consideration the written coverage. This did not go well, as players often look more skillless than voiceless. It's been noted all over social media over the weekend, but these players were often bricking thanks to their oversighting, making illegal plays that were so suspicious players were accusing them of cheating online, and some flat out appeared to not even know how to combo with the deck. I'll probably have some b-roll footage of two different matches where Voices Voice players completely bricked going first and just passed with a couple of set cards in their back row against the fire deck in back-to-back -back rounds. This is also while having Droll and Lockbird in their hand, which in my opinion isn't all that great against the fire deck and probably led to them breaking in the first place. We saw incredibly suspicious plays like when a Voices Voice player picked up an opponent's monster in an attempt to read it, only to return said monster to a different column than which it was summoned, that just happened to be the Anima column, then attempted to make Relinquish Anima later in the turn and suck up the monster that they illegally put in the wrong column. Lastly, in the round five written feature, we wish witnessed one duelist apparently just forget how to play the deck entirely as he opened with an unopposed Diviner of the Herald, only to send Saphira to the graveyard, set two cards in his back row and pass to his opponent rather than dumping Trias, tributing it for Herald and then summoning Low for the deck. I don't even play Voiceless Voice, but I'm pretty sure that that's the full standard combo for the Voiceless Voice deck and one of the first plays that you learn when you're playing the deck. So overall, not the greatest marketing to get players to flock towards Voiceless Voice, but speaking of flocks, Konami did feature other themes on stream, such as Flu Wanderies and Sword Soul for the Round 3 feature, which was a throwback to the Burst of Destiny core booster set, and in a shocking turn of events, actually gave U-Bell a feature match in Round 4, which obviously made the crowd go wild as Asian Persuasion, Slim Yu-Gi-Oh! and a team of dueling grandpas all played U-Bell and, shockingly, started the tournament with a 4-0 record, which I shouldn't have to say this, but I mean, obviously, that is incredibly impressive. Castura was also a deck with a lot of representation. Honestly, it seemed that it may have been the third or fourth most popular deck at the entire event after the fire decks in Voiceless Voice. Many people perceive it to be the quote unquote shifter deck of choice and its ability to banish extra deck cards with Unicorn and graveyard pieces with Birth do make it a very attractive pick right now. Another observation I had is that there were a ton of hand traps in basically every deck. I think outside of branded, every deck appeared to be playing at least the standard 12 hand trap lineup of basically pick four hand traps that you like and max out on them. I will say that Droll and Lockbird in particular was incredibly popular at the event, but seemed fairly average often when it was being dropped against the fire decks compared to Nibiru, which was honestly causing havoc left and right in the future matches all the way up to the semifinals. We also saw players going outside the box with cards like DD Crow and Ghost Mourner and Moonlight Chill. So talents and called by the grave be damned, it appears that the hand trap meta is definitely in and in full effect. For other tech choices, 
the feature writer staff pointed out cards like Fistules making a comeback into people's sideboards. Fistules obviously aren't good into fire decks, however they are very strong into Voiceless Voice, Branded, and other rogue matchups like Ubel, Labyrinth, or Centurion if you happen to run into those. Also Typhoon made an appearance at the event, no not Mystical Space Typhoon, but the trap version of the card, just plain old Typhoon, the one that pops a face up Speller Trap on the field and can even be used from the hand turn zero during your opponent's turn as long as they have two or more spell and trap cards on the field. Typhoon is excellent as it can be used during the end phase to target your opponent's Fire King Island and basically wipe all their monsters right off the field. They're probably going to have that Fire King Island in addition to an SP Little Knights or an IP Mask Arena in their spell and trap zone that they want to summon back from Flame Burge. So those are the, uh, the two spell and traps that you need to meet the condition. It's a really devastating play in that scenario, but even if you aren't in that particular situation and you're going against another common meta deck, if you're going second, it can just be an out to a floodgate like an anti-spell fragrance or a summon limit as again, your opponent will have that card on the field and then they'll probably have another speller trap. So it's kind of like a cosmic cyclone in that very scenario. YCS Vegas also appears to have answered some questions like if we're in a tier zero format. Konami posted the breakdowns after day one of Swiss as well as going into the top 16 and top eight. Originally, Fire decks controlled about 73% of the field going into day two, but that number jumped to a whopping 83% with the top 16 as 40 of the 48 decks were Fire decks. It's also worth noting that at every single measured level, Snake Eye Fire King was more popular than Pure Snake Eye. However, Pure Snake Eye jumped the Fire King version as we reached the quarterfinals. Speaking of the top eight, despite all the poor Voices Voice play that we saw in the early feature matches, Voiceless Voice remarkably put five players into the top eight round, which featured 24 duelists. The top four was completely fire-based and featured excellent technical play as the finals ended up being a blockbuster showdown between PAX Team, which featured Sammy, aka Team Samurai 1X, and Hani Jawari, which had a team featuring his brother and Christopher LeBlanc. It goes without saying that Fire won the event as Hani's Team Jawari was victorious. The finals did give us a glimpse at Cross Out Designator and its potency in this specific format, and also it appears PAX's personal goo of lullaby of obedience in the main deck which I'm gonna be honest here the last time I remember seeing this card at such a high level of competitive meta was probably back in Zodiac formats overall I would say that this was an incredibly entertaining and engaging weekend and of course you'll always like to see us breaking attendance numbers with of course this being the largest team YCS in Yu-Gi-Oh history I think the only criticism I had was something that Konami doesn't really have control over well not not especially and that's when they were having the future matches and they weren't going after like the quote unquote pro players or I guess in this case the pro teams and that kind of led to the technical play not being like super high or super great a lot of illegal plays being done on stream you know players activating prosperity early in their turn and then later trying to draw two cards from talents which you obviously can't do but um yeah I think we're in a very interesting situation fire is confirmed to be tier zero just based off the numbers of this event but it does look like there are some other options and of course you do want to see where the meta is going to progress you know probably going to have a lot of banlist discussions coming out of this now that we have that you know official confirmation of fire tier zero but you guys let me know what you think in the comment section below also shout outs to pack uh the matches that they were showing of him i mean he was just absolutely playing out of his freaking mind he could be the best player in the tcg right now so shout outs definitely to pack he got second place but uh, he keeps playing like this so definitely win a ycs anyways those are just my thoughts and comments you leave yours in the comment section below also don't forget to check out my patreon you can become a member for just one dollar a month thank you guys for watching as always